I love hearing stories like that um, from people, and, and you know, we get to hear uh, some of Blake's story last week, Josh and Emily this week. We've posted a couple on our website, and then there'll be a couple more stories that we share with you next week. But the whole point of it is um, that they have discovered what I hope you all discover, and it's that life is better connected. Uh, all of us. I mean, I could be wrong. Some of y'all might like being miserable. I'm not really sure. Uh, but most of us, at least most of us, don't want to be miserable. We, we don't I mean, that was the joke. That's the one joke you get this week. Um, you know, I, we don't want to be miserable. We, we don't, we don't want to be unhappy. We don't want to be unsatisfied with life. Um, but sometimes we hear the things that we know will make us feel satisfied, and they just kind of seem hard. <laughs> uh, or like, I know that would help, but I'm not sure I can commit to do that. I know that would make a difference, but is there any other way? You know, is there anything else that I could do? Uh, but, but the people that we've been hearing from, and, and, and hopefully people you're sitting around in this room today, uh, they know, like, the thing that has made a difference in their life has been relationships, you know, relationships. Just having, having constant relationships um, that are healthy with people. Uh, people who love them enough to say, you know what, um, this is not what's God's best for you. Or, you know what, I- I'm here for you in the midst of this mess that you're in. And so this whole point of this series, last week, today, and then next week, is really just talk about relationships. We, we focused really hard on hum- human relationships last week. Um, and uh, there's a reason behind that. Uh, but I was kind of setting the stage for what I really want to talk about today and what's going to lead into next week, which is just this idea of satisfaction. Um, and where do we find satisfaction as human beings? Where does it come from? The first thing I want to tell you, and this is probably something that's not... Um, overly commonly known is that satisfaction is an outcome. I want you to know that. It's important. Satisfaction is an outcome. In other words, it's not something that you just like, you can, you can get up and like, I'm satisfied now. All right? It's actually the result of something that you've done. It's a result of decisions that you made. In other words, satisfaction is not immediately accessible. Uh, unfortunately, if I could snap my finger and make all of your lives better, promise you that I would, okay? I would, because I love you. I, I don't want you to have bad lives. I, if I could snap my fingers and make you feel more satisfied with what God has given you and where you're going to live in your life right now, gosh, I would do that for you, and you would do that too. But the trouble is it's an outcome, right? Satisfaction is an outcome. It's not something that just instantaneously happens. It comes because of decisions that we've made. Now, I, um, in, in my little infinitesimal small um, experience that I've had on this earth, have come to realize that satisfaction is directly tied to relationship. It is. Uh, and I've been talking about this for years, okay? I've been talking about this way before I even came here, that the level of our satisfaction in our life is directly correlated to the satisfaction we find in our relationships. Here's what I know. Uh, it's because they have peace. Satisfied people have peace with kind of three different things, okay? And here's what they are. Number one, satisfied people have peace with themselves, right? They're at peace with themselves. If you want to be satisfied, if you talk to people who find the satisfaction in their life, they're good with who they are, right? They don't, they don't look at people and go, oh my gosh, he's got a bigger car, or he's got a bigger house, or he's smarter than me, or look how intelligent and handsome or beautiful and all that. They just, they're just satisfied with themselves. They don't have to have more or less. They're content and satisfied with who they were built to be and who they are. And this level of satisfaction with yourself leads to immense peace, It leads to immense peace in your life and in my life and in every other life that's willing to kind of get satisfied with themselves. They also have satisfaction and peace with others, okay? Satisfied people have peace with other people. It's really, really tough. You know this. It's really, really tough to feel content and happy and satisfied if you're in a fight with somebody else that's in your life. It could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be your boss, it could be a friend, it could be a frenemy, it could be any of those things, okay? But when we're at conflict and you feel tension in your relationship with other people, it's not a very satisfied place to be. When you don't have peace with the people that are around you, right, it's really, really tough. In other words, satisfied people aren't like angry. They're not, they're not like frustrated. And even if someone has a, you know, a problem with them, they're just kind of content to go, well, let's sort it out like adults, you know, that's a rare thing, it seems like, in this day and age, especially with the ability for me to go on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or something and call you a low-down, dirty dog and then hide behind my ISP for the rest of the day. You know, it's like, it's really easy for us to do that, but the truth is, if you want satisfaction, you, you need to have peace with other people. But the other one, and this is really what I want to zero in on today, is that satisfied people have peace with God. Satisfied people have peace. They're at peace with God. See, Something happens in you when you find yourself at peace with God the Father. Something happens in you in the way that you look at life, in the way that you relate to others, in the way that you relate to yourself. When you find yourself at peace with God, something happens, something is catalyzed inside you that makes life different. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, it makes life better. 
let me put it to you maybe this way. Peace with God, okay? Peace with God paves the way to peace with ourselves and equips us to make peace with others. These things are all connected. Think about this for a minute. Peace with God paves the way for you to be at peace with yourself. If you find yourself not being able to forgive yourself for your past, you're continually carrying around the junk of your past, the decisions you've made, the hardships you've experienced, the hurt that you've caused, the hurt that you've been given, all of that stuff, all that baggage. If you're constantly carrying that around, it's really hard to be at peace with yourself. And for God to come and offer this ability, he says, look, I love you. Put that stuff down. I love you. Lay it down. You don't have to carry that with you. I love you. Let it go. When we make peace with God, it makes it so much easier to make peace with ourselves because we realize, you know what? God has forgiven me for this stuff. I, I don't have to carry it around with me. And so peace with God paves the way for peace with ourselves. But it also equips us to make peace with others. The entire New Testament ethic, okay? And don't take my word for this. Please go read the New Testament and it'll prove it to you. The entire New Testament ethic, everything Jesus was trying to accomplish in the kingdom is based in this idea that we should do to others as we would have them do to us. That we should love them as we love ourselves. And when we find ourselves at peace with God and it paves the way for us to be peace with ourselves, all of a sudden we are equipped to be at peace with other people. I, I was talking to somebody recently about small groups and I was trying to convince them that they need to get in a circle. And they said, Drew, I just don't like people. <laughs> I was like, that's a heck of a thing to say to your pastor. Anyway, um, you know, I, they, they don't go to church here. There was someplace else, which explains everything. I'm just joking. Um, and, and the thing is, it's like, the truth is, if, if you find yourself in that place, I get it. But what if the reason you struggle in your earthly relationships is because there might not be something right maybe in your relationship with your Heavenly Father? See, sometimes the baggage that we feel, the, the, the stuff that we're carrying that really nobody else knows about, we carry that into our relationships. Like it's, it's like prepackaged stuff that we dump on the people that want to relate to us. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves at odds and at conflict with people who are around us. And we say, well, it's just easier for me to be alone. It's easier for me to isolate. It's easier for me to do my own thing. When really the, the centerpiece of this is maybe there might be conflict between you and God. And if you could settle that conflict between you and God, what if it made your relationship with yourself and with other people better? What if by settling the relationship between you and God, you could actually make your relationships with other people better? That's what I want to talk about with you in just a few minutes today. Okay, if you just give me your attention for just a few minutes, we're going to try to walk through this together. Now, if we say that there's actually, you know, uh, this not having peace in our relationship with God, that kind of insinuates there's a conflict, right? That there might be a conflict between us and God. Well, here's kind of how the New Testament lays that out. And the Old Testament speaks to this too, but specifically in the New Testament, it talks about this conflict between us and God. It's, it's really centered around two things, sin and your sin, right? The conflict is centered around sin, kind of this corporate big everybody sin stuff and then there's your specific stuff there's the everybody stuff and then there's your specific stuff well just for a minute i want to dig into the sin okay let's talk about this one first let's talk about this corporate idea of sin first and there's been a lot of theological work that's been done to try to help us understand this but the best way that i have come to grips with being able to understand what this really looks like is to think about your country of origin okay here's the example I was born in the United States of America, which means I am a United States citizen. There's nothing that I can do about that. There is nothing that I can, it's, it's not fair, right? I didn't choose it. It comes with all the consequences and all the blessings, but I didn't choose it. I'm just born into it. That means my citizenship is here in the United States. You may have been born someplace else. Your citizenship might be someplace else, but my citizenship is here in the United States. I'm a United States citizen. And again, that comes with all of the good things, but all the bad things. One of the consequences of that is that I only speak one language. I do. Even though I had like six semesters of Spanish in, uh, in high school and some in college, I couldn't tell you anything. Uh, but the thing is, if you were born someplace else, and some of you all were, you spent any time abroad, what you realize is it's really okay while you're here, but the second you move to another country, everyone else speaks like five have you noticed this? I went to Israel not long ago, and people were speaking like six different languages, and there were dialects in between it, and everyone understood, and I just felt like really dumb. They were probably talking about me to my face, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. It's one of the consequences, right? It's one of the realities. We, we're born here in the United States. We, you know, it's not fair. I didn't choose it. You didn't choose it. It comes with all the blessings, but it also comes with all of the consequences. And look, ultimately, I'm proud to be an American citizen, and I'm proud to live here in this country like you probably are. And uh, you know, wherever country you're from, you're probably proud of that, but you didn't choose it. You were born here. 
See, that's the best way for us to kind of understand this big corporate idea of sin, is that sin, we were born into this born into this broken relationship. We were born into this kingdom, born into this nation called sin. It had dominion over us. You didn't choose it. You didn't ask for it. It just kind of happens. Paul, who's like really super technical and complicated and, you know, really theological, he he puts it together like this. This is what he says. Um, And he was speaking this to the Romans, and he was speaking it to like first century Christians, which I find really interesting. But but here's, here's what he said. Therefore, Just as sin, this is the big sin, entered the world through one man and death through sin. This is something that whether you're a Jesus follower or not, whether you're a believer or not, whether you're even cynical about church or not, this is something you have to have understood at one time or another, that wherever there's sin, there's death. Wherever there's sin, there's death. In other words, some of you are killing your relationship with your spouse. Some of you are killing your relationship with, with your kids. Some of you are killing your bodies. Some of you are killing your relationships with, with your boss or your, your, your family. Some of you are killing your careers. When, whenever there's sin, there's death associated with it. So Paul's just kind of making it really simple for people to understand that this came in through one person. There was a time when sin was not here. All right, God created this place perfectly, and then through our decisions as human beings, sin came into the picture. Sin is the absence of the goodness of God. It's the, the, it's the choice against or choice not for God. And so this, this, this thing came into being, and it's everybody. It's an all skate. We're all, we're all here. It's all a part of the kingdom that we're stuck in now. And he says it brought death with it. And, and this way, death came to all people. It's everybody. When I was a kid, and if any of y'all grew up in church, what I'm about to say is going to be familiar to you and it may make you cringe a little bit. For those of you that uh, did not grow up in church, what I'm about to show you will still make you cringe, but at least you'll have the history of why we, we see it. When I was a kid, they used to do this thing where they would pass out these little cards called tracks. You ever heard of this before? Um, and, you know, like the worst ones were the ones that looked like money. So you're like, you're walking down the street and it looks like there's a hundred dollar bill laying on the sidewalk and you pick it up and it's Jesus, you know, and and like you read it, and it's like, oh man, and then you want to throw it away, but it's like, I can't throw Jesus away. <laughs> this is kind of weird. It's making me uncomfortable. And so it's probably stuck in some book at your house, just like mine are. And everyone, or you, you gave it to the waitress with a tip, you know, so they thought they were getting a huge tip and they just got Jesus and, you know, that kind of thing. This was the culture in which I grew up in, okay? But on one of those tracks, on one of those little cards when I was a kid, there was a picture, and it looked kind of like this. Have you ever seen this picture before? Now, this one kind of looks like Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote, but go with me, okay, because this is my art skills. But, but there would be this chasm. There's like us on one side and God's on the other. And it's like we're in this kingdom and God's in that kingdom and there's no way for us to get from here to there, right? There's no way for us to behave our way. No matter how we behave over here, no matter what choices, I mean, it's like, it's like the whole language thing. You can learn to speak a different language, but it doesn't make you a citizen of a different country, Right? You can learn to, to put on the customs. You know, I, I had an Australian professor in seminary. He was one of my favorite professors, and it made me say good day, mate, every once in a while, but it did not make me Australian, right? And he made me remind of that often. But the point is, you, can, you, you know, the, the whole thing was you, you can change your behavior, but it's not going to change your location. It's not going to change your citizenship. It won't change your passport. It won't change where you're living. And so then Jesus comes along, and he, he you know, God says that he came to bridge this gap, right, to to give us a way to move from citizenship over here to citizenship over there. This is when he told Nicodemus at night one night, he said, you must be reborn. You must be born again. That's what he meant. Because the only way to change your citizenship is to be born again in a new nation, right? And so what Jesus says is, I'm going to give you the capacity to be born in a new nation. You don't belong in the kingdom of God, but God wants you there. And so I'm going to give you the opportunity to bridge this gap, to cross this threshold. And it's not by your behavior. It's not by you changing your language. It's literally about God's grace giving you the capacity to be born again. Now, Nicodemus was like, what what do we mean? How am I going to re-enter my mother's womb? And Jesus was thinking, like, that's really gross. That's not what I'm talking about, right? He thought it. He didn't say it out loud. What he said was, was that this is all about new citizenship in a new place, that you have citizenship in a place of darkness and sin and brokenness, but God is offering citizenship in a new place. Again, Paul, who's super complicated and super complex, was writing to the church at Colossae, and he said it this way. For he, being God, has rescued us from the dominion, right, or the nation, or the country of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom, right? This kingdom, this is what Jesus talked about all the time through the New Testament, I want to set up a new kingdom. The kingdom of God is drawn near. Repent and believe the gospel. 
This is the good news, that the kingdom of God has come. Jesus said this over and over again. The dominion of darkness, he, he, this is where we were stuck, and then Jesus came and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. That you can move from one place, a place of conflict, a place of separation, a place where there's this chasm, this conflict between you and God, where he's like, look, I love you, but we're just not, we're not in sync. You're there, and I'm here, and I, I want you over here, but you got to be born again. you got to move into this new nation. This is the problem that Jesus immediately solved. That he was going to pave a way. He was going to create a bridge. When I was a kid, they would lay the cross. Like, it wasn't a big blue bridge. It was like the cross. And I was like, how do you get over the cross beam? That's kind of weird. Anyway, you would move from where you were to where God's kingdom was. And Paul, again, continuing, he says it like this. Therefore, since we have been justified, we doesn't just mean we, we, okay? In this case, he was talking about first century Jesus followers who lived in Rome. And the beautiful thing was, Paul had never met them. So how could he say we? Paul, how can you say we? You don't even know who I am, right? How can you include me in this thing? Well, because of what he's about to say. We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God, right? I, I don't act very just. It's okay. You've been given justification from God. You've been given justification through Jesus. We, and now you can understand that it is all of us as a we, we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access. Access to what? Well, the kingdom of God. You've been bridged across this gap. That's the first big piece of this conflict, okay? That's the, that's the conflict that, that we find ourselves in with God. Many of us in this room have already dealt with that. Many of us in this room have already dealt with that and figured that out, right? We understood that kind of from an early age. Many of us haven't. Now, let me sum it up in a really simple, maybe like Trimble County, Kentucky way for you to understand this, okay? Peace with God begins with faith in Christ. Peace with God begins with faith in Christ. But again, that's just part one of the conflict. Remember a while ago I said there were two conflicts, right? There was sin, and then there's your sin. So what do we do about your stuff, right? My stuff. What do I do about my stuff? God solved this big idea of sin and brokenness entering into the world. He's given us a bridge, and he's given us the ability to move across. But what am I supposed to do about that, Right? How do, I, what, how do I deal with my stuff? Do you remember when you were a kid, and probably around the time between you were like 12 and 18, that there was conflict in your home? Remember this conflict between your mom and dad and you? Your mom and dad, who, you know, if you grew up in a home like I did where your mom and dad loved you, I know that's not an overly common thing, and I'm super grateful for it, but if you grew up in a home where your mom and dad loved you like mine did, then there were moments where they told you no, and you didn't understand why they told you no. And you probably did that thing where either you tried to ask the other parent first, and when you realized they were on the same team and they both said no, you crossed your arms and you got mad, right? I'm just dealing with this now that I have one teenager and one preteen in my house. I'm just starting, like, the other two still love me, but the, other, the, the older two, I'm not really sure yet. But there's this conflict, there's this tension, because you, like, listen, parents, you understand this. When your kids come to you with something you know is not in their best interest, you know is not in their best interest, you have a decision to make. You can do what's best for you, or you can do what's best for them. Because the hardest things, gosh, as a dad, the hardest things are the moments <coughs> when I have to walk into one of my kids' rooms and go, this thing that you're doing, like, I'm going to choose between having us peace, because what I'm about to say to you is best for you in the long run. And it's going to create conflict, right? And we have this peace that's going to break it by me saying, look, this, you know, this is not what's best for you. This is not how we're supposed to behave. This is not what's going to get you where you want to go. And it's going to break the peace between you and I. But in the long run, it is worth it. In the long run, it'll get you where you want to go. And again, as teenagers, we don't get that. And I'm not expecting the teens in the room to suddenly get it. Trust me, by the time you turn like 25, you're going to go, Mom, Dad, you were so right. And you don't believe me now, but I promise it will happen. Especially when you get kids of your own who are exactly like you. Like my dad is laughing in heaven somewhere. I promise that. Um, the thing that was going on when I was a kid was they loved me too much. They loved me too much to just let me do whatever I want to do. In other words, like they could have. They could have walked in and go, you know what? <laughs> you know, no, you don't have to clean anything up. It's not a big deal. Oh, your friends, I don't really like them all that much. But sure, you can have the house and I'll leave. You just call me. Just call me when you're done with your party. I'll clean it up. No, no, no. You don't have to deal with anything. You know, oh, you want to you know, spend money like water? Totally cool. It's completely fine. And I would have been good with them. But in the long run, that would have made my life really bad. It would not have led to satisfaction. And every parent, every day, deals with that dichotomy. Do I do what's best for you, 
I do, I do what's best for me. And for my earthly parents, their love was too strong to just go along. Their love was just too strong to go along with whatever it is I brought up because I didn't know any better. I thought I knew everything. See, in the same way, your heavenly Father relates to you. In other words, God's love is just too strong to simply go along. How do you understand that you have sin? How do you understand that there's brokenness and mess in your life? Why is it constantly that God seems to ding your conscience, right? And you're just going along and everything seems fine. And all of a sudden, you just hear God going, that's not what's best for you. And it creates this tension where you're tempted to just cross your arms and go, God, you don't know what's best for me. You don't know what's going on in my life. And we become that teenager inside all over Again, God loves you too much to simply go along. He knows what's best for you in the long run. So how do you understand your sin? It's God going, listen, that's not going to get where you are. Gonna, that's not going to get you where you want to go. That's not going to take you where you want to be. That's not going to lead to a satisfying life like you think it will. Jesus said that the best way for our finite little human brains to understand the infinite, all-powerful God was to understand him as a perfect, heavenly father. That even with that, it would be pale in comparison to who God truly is. But the best way for us to understand is that the creator of the universe is like our heavenly father. He's got your back. He loves you unconditionally. And when my kids do things that disappoint me, when my kids do things that hurt my feelings, I don't stop loving them. And that little thing that's reflected in me as an earthly father is infinitely reflected in your heavenly father. And so when you understand the brokenness that's in your life and the mistakes that you're making, or you get frustrated that God tells you no, because there will be times where God will look at you and he will say, no. And it's not because he doesn't love you. And it's not because he doesn't want something for you. It's not because he doesn't want better, satisfying life for you. It's exactly because of that. Because he knows in the long run what you're doing won't get you where you want to go, where he wants you to be. And some of us are wrecking. We are wrecking the satisfied life God wants for us because he's telling us his will is here and we're just kind of getting off. We're not in fellowship with it. We're not, we're not connected to it. Again, John, who, the, the apostle John, who traveled with Jesus and, you know, spent his, Jesus' entire ministry, John was there, okay, everything. The things that, the stories that didn't get told, the stories that did get told, everything that we know about Jesus, John experienced it. And when he was an old man, right, when he was kind of putting the pieces together and comparing everything he learned from Jesus to this life that he'd lived, he wrote something really important that speaks right to the heart of this. And it's harsh, okay? And so part of me kind of imagines John as like the crusty old guy who's like, I'm not going to pull the punches, okay? I'm going to tell them the truth because this is what they need to hear. And it's hard, but listen to what he says about this very thing when we find ourselves kind of out of sync with God. Look what he says. If we claim to have fellowship, in other words, that means peace, okay? If, it, if we claim to have peace, like God, you and I, we're good, and yet walk in the darkness... So we claim to be in the kingdom of God and we claim that, that, that you know, we're, we're good and we're, you know, we're solid and we're Jesus followers and we sing the songs and we, we go to church and we do the things and yet we live as if we walk in darkness. John says we're liars. We're like, ouch, that hurts. He goes, I don't have time to pull punches for you. I'm on my deathbed, okay? We lie and we do not live out the truth. This is huge because well, why would you say that to me, John? Well, because God has something better for you and you're missing it. So get to the point. Listen, you're, you're, you want to be here with your will and God's will is like this and you're completely out of sync. God wants to bring you into sync with his will for your life and that will bring satisfaction, but you're missing it. And in so doing, you are deceiving yourself, you are deceiving the people that are around you and ultimately you are disconnecting yourself when God's best is for you. Then it gets worse. He says it even deeper than this. He continues, same letter, he says, Whoever claims to love God, <coughs> yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. <coughs> if you claim to love God, but you hate somebody else, he said that the love of God can't be in you. Remember the whole New Testament ethic is this whole idea that you're going to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And if you find yourself hating someone, and, and you say you love God, well, those things, those are opposite. You're, you're acting like you're in this kingdom and claiming to be in this kingdom, and there's a chasm between those two things. That's not the same thing. And he says, you're a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Wow. I don't have time to pull punches, John says. This is serious. This is important. This is massive. And for those of us that find ourselves dissatisfied with life, it could be some of this. 
It really could be. If you find yourself struggling every day, like I just, I don't understand this whole life thing and I don't know why things are so hard and I just, I, like, I wake up and people who have less than me seem so much more content with their life than I do. It could be this. See, there's two pieces to this in this conflict and many of us have solved part of it but not the whole thing, right? So the first one, as I just said, let's sum it together. Peace with God begins with faith in Christ. There are people in this room who when you walk in this sermon has driven you crazy the whole time I've been preaching. Because you know that you and God have not come to a place where you are in, you're at peace with God. You're not in peace. You, you have not ended the conflict between you and God. God says, look, if you want to begin, if you want to place the foundation, look, if you want to settle this, then you just build your entire foundation of your life on me. And, you know, this, again, this, that's what faith actually means. It's like it's trust. What am I going to trust? What am I going to, what am I going to latch on to? What I'm going to say is true, and, tr- and, and that truth is going to be my truth that I'm going to latch on to forever. God says, if you want peace with me, you make that truth my son. You believe. You just believe. Just believe in, this, in, the, in the center of your heart that, that Jesus died for your sins, that I have really made this bridge, that there is this chasm between us, and that I'm going to forgive that, I'm going to let you walk across the bridge, and that your citizenship now belongs in the kingdom of God. And some of you haven't done that yet. And today, in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you the chance to do that. But, but many of us, many, many, many of us in this room have already done this. And the conflict we still have in our lives is that we haven't given ourselves over to Jesus. We haven't actually submitted to his will. See, peace with God is sustained by submission to Christ. This is a lesson I did not learn the easy way. This is a lesson that I didn't hear a lot when I was a kid. But I have learned it through hard situations in life over and over and over that my faith this peace that I have with God this 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 connection that I have between me and God it's sustained and furthered and grown every time I go okay Jesus I'm going to follow you yes Jesus now what's the question every time I've decided to go you know I know that like that's going to be expensive or that's kind of scary or that's really hard or that's going to hurt but I choose to follow Jesus anyway. My peace with God has been furthered and sustained by that decision. And some of us in this room, this is a lesson we got to learn today. And the beauty is, you already know what that thing that's bringing you into conflict with God is. I don't even have to tell you. You knew about it when you walked through the door. And you were like grading this thing like, you know, this is, a, this is a, 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 an A through D scale or an A through F scale. And a D equals diploma in my relationship with God God said, okay, you can have faith and build your foundation. You can have your citizenship move. But if you really want a satisfied life, if you really want everything that I'm offering you, if you really want life to make sense, if you really want peace, if you really want to be connected, well, what you're missing is following Jesus. What you're missing is this whole idea of saying, okay, Jesus, you're my Savior and you're my Lord. You're my Savior and you're my Lord. The answer is yes. What's the question? And I don't know what those things are for you, but some of us in this room, we got those things. We got those things. <clears throat> the band's going to come out in just a second, um, and we're going to sing a song. And I'm going to give you some space to pray. For those of you that have never made a decision um, about Jesus before, that you've walked through this door and you've been listening to this stuff for a while, and you realize in your heart of hearts that it is time for you to make a decision to build your foundation on, the, on this idea of Jesus, that, that you're going to believe that, that, that you decided that Jesus really did die for your sins, that he really was resurrected from the grave, and it's time for you to make that decision. You're going to pray, and I don't even have to give you the words, okay? It's going to be very simple. You're just making that commitment that, that today I'm going to believe, that I believe and my life is built on this faith and this foundation that, 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 that my peace with God is built on the faith in Jesus. And for those of you that are in conflict or you're, you're struggling, um, This is the space for you to go, God, this thing that I have between us, this thing that you keep dinging my conscience about, this thing that you've told me like it's just not your best for me, I'm going to lay it down today. And it's going to be hard, and it's going to hurt, and it's going to stink, and it's going to be difficult, and it's going to cause me to have to make more hard decisions, it's going to cause me to have to do different things, or it could be the most freeing thing you've ever done. It'll probably be both. Because that thing that's keeping you out of fellowship and out of sync with God, when you bring yourself into alignment with God and see what he will do with that faith, right? When you intersect your faith with God's great faithfulness and you bring those things into alignment, God will change your life. 
And the thing that you think is bringing you happiness, the thing that you think is bringing you satisfaction is actually killing you. And it's killing the people that are in your life. And God says, let it go. Let it go. And feel what satisfied life really could be. Let me be your Savior and your Lord. Follow me. Follow me. I think that's why Jesus always issued that invitation. It's because he knew that we could model ourselves on what he was doing. And so as the band comes, I want to welcome Jamie and them out. They're going to sing a song, and it's about grace. And it's a really great song um, that I'm going to tell a story really quick as they're kind of tuning up. Um, but it's a really great song that it reminds us really what was at stake with God and us and what he gives us and how it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. It's really awesome. About eight months ago, um, this is, this is going to make me sound like a really terrible parent, but I've decided to tell the story and now I can't back off. So about eight months ago, uh, one of, Carson just disappeared. We were at home. Um, she was gone. She like, you know, parents, have you ever experienced it before? There's a level of like fear that's like, and then there's the feeling of your, your child is not there. You know, like it's just the most heightened, scary, horrible thing. And like nobody knew where she was. So we just, we just couldn't find her. Like we were calling and, you know, we were out in the yard yelling and nobody knew. And so I was just like, Shanna's this close to calling the cops and like, what are we going to do? And I said, let's just, hold on, let's just call our neighbors and see if maybe she went to the name of the neighbor's kids. kids. So we called Mary Emma's house. She wasn't there. We, we called, you know, down the street to, to um, Annie's house. She wasn't there. We called next door to Anna Grace's house and her mom picks up and I said, listen, I'm so sorry to bother you. Uh, we're looking for Carson. And she goes, oh yeah, she's here. And so there was that feeling of like instant relief in my, in my brain. I'm like, Shanna, she's at Anna's house. It's okay. I wasn't upset. Like the, the hilarious thing was, I'm like, okay, is she okay? And Carson's like, who's on the phone? Like she had no idea that it was freaky, that we were dying in the house, right? When she came home, I wasn't upset. I was what? Relieved. Yeah, I was Relieved. And if you've been running from God for a really long time, your heavenly father is not upset with you. He will be relieved when you come home. He's not gonna point out your flaws. He's gonna point out like, oh my gosh, look what you did. He's not gonna throw the book at you. He's gonna go, thank God you are home. And that's the invitation. So the band's gonna play a song. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray really fast. And at the end of that prayer, I've asked them to just leave just a, a bit of silence. And in that silence, I want you to take this stuff, whatever it is. If, if it's your first time committing to Jesus, do it. Do it today. Don't wait. Build your foundation on the faith and the trust in your Savior, Jesus Christ. But, but if you're ready to lay that other junk down, this is the time. You know what it is. I don't need to tell you. God's not going to be upset with you. He's just going to be glad you've come home. So lay it down. So would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, uh, give us the bravery and the courage today to believe this word about you that you love us, you have grace for us, that this conflict between us and you does not have to continue. You have done everything you need to do to lay it down. You've been the adult in this relationship and we as the kids have been frustrated and crossing our arms and fighting every minute and you're saying, I want peace, I want peace. So God, would you let us claim that peace today? For those that are gonna lay something down, God, give them the boldest courage to say yes to it and then walk with them as they continue to walk away from it. And for those in this room today, they're going to commit to you for the first time. <coughs> Help them to know they have a community of people here that love them, that they have a heavenly father that loves them, and that they have just made the best decision they will ever make in their life. God, these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let me give you just a little bit of space.